I'm going to be talking about developer velocity today and how we can actually improve it. Um, so, well, developing, measuring developer record is something that uh, we've all been chasing around for a while. Um, but whatever metric we seem to put on it doesn't seem to work. I'm not sure how many of you have actually tried it. You know, a lot of people try measuring developer productivity with things like lines of code, which is not a good measure, obviously, because each language is different. And of course, you know, within the same language, you can actually start to break down a single line into multiple lines. So obviously it doesn't work. Uh, of course, you know, isn't now, if you do write concise code, that's obviously better, right? So using that and what about comments, all those kind of things doesn't work well for lines of code, right? Uh, other things that people have tried is things like function points or number of user stories or calculating uh, it based on sprint velocity and things like that. Now, this is probably a good point, uh, place to actually point out that what I'm actually talking about developer velocity has got nothing to do with sprint velocity, which we kind of like use in, when we use agile methodologies and things like that, right? Um, how about number of bugs uh, introduced based on severity and things like that? That's another thing that people actually use. But one thing that I've actually found is that when a lot of these things, um, you know, the metrics can actually be gamed. And if it can be gamed, it's not a good measure, right? Um, one thing I will actually say is like from my past experience itself, it has always seemed like um, collectively measuring it for the entire development team seems like a better way of actually measuring productivity rather than doing it individually. Yes, you can actually have, um, you know, as your performance, end of your performance and things like that, you can actually have certain things that you measure them by. Um, but measuring people's uh, performance based on things like lines of code and things like that don't, don't always work. And it's probably better to um, measure the entire team's uh, performance and because that kind of like seems to drive uh, how the business is progressing and things like that as well. So uh, the topic that I'm going to talk about is uh, how you kind of like start to measure productivity as a whole for an organization or a team. And um, that's where the whole developer velocity comes in. And this is, there's an index for it called developer velocity index. So my talk itself is based into, uh, I'll kind of like, I'll give you a quick introduction to what developer velocity and developer velocity indexes. And then we'll dig deep into uh, uh, into um, DVI itself. And then we'll talk, a there are a few observations, research observations, and we'll kind of like finish up with further reading as such, yeah? So let's go into a uh, bit of introduction. So so what is, what is developer velocity? Now, McKinsey released a white paper based on research that they had done earlier this year. And they said that software excellence basically fuels business performance. Now, this is the case of technology driving better business performance. So what causes the software excellence, right? How do you actually measure? It turns out that there are a number of drivers and collectively all these drivers contribute to a metric um, that you can actually measure and you know, see whether you're progressing, you're getting better at it or getting worse and all that kind of stuff. And that this measures a developer velocity and the, the, the actual metric is called the developer velocity index. It's as simple as that. But I think before you even get into it, the bigger question that needs to be answered is like, but what is the problem that we're actually trying to solve, right? So as it turns out, um, you know, investment in software development have not always led to meaningful performance improvement for the business. So when they, um, when they are launching something, uh, when the business wants to launch something new, it basically takes them several months to actually get it onto production. And, and then they try this other approach where they kind of like build everything in um, kind of like in a sandbox environment. And it all seems fine, but they went to, when they want to kind of like scale it, and then that becomes a problem as well. So um, knowing and addressing what levers to pull will help in addressing these problems. You know, the, the, the developer velocity things that I actually spoke about, you know, what are the things that you can actually uh, adjust to actually help in, um, you know, enhancing this, you know, the, uh, you know, business performance as a whole. So that's, that's why we, you know, that's why this is actually an important measure. So let's actually start to look at the developer velocity index itself. Now, DVI, it, it kind of like it's, um, uh, there are about three main categories in which DVI is actually split up. And there's a basically a technology uh, working practice and organization enablement. And across these, um, and within these things, there are 13 different capabilities. Um, and um, there are four different drivers in total in each and every one of these capabilities itself. So what I'll do is I will actually go through each and every one of these things um, and uh, um, you know, in a little bit more detail. Now, 
when uh, when McKinsey released this paper, uh, I don't know, I think it was probably about March or April this year, and then Microsoft did a release of a tool in in uh, Build Conference, and uh, it's an online tool. It's called uh, you can go over to developervelocityassessment.com, and uh, you should be able to. It'll ask you a series of questions, and by answering all these questions, it kind of like gives you a number, and that is your developer velocity index. Now. It really doesn't, in my opinion, it really doesn't matter what your DVI index is now, but you can actually use that to constantly improve it. So what the site also allows you to do is this actually allows you to track it over a period of time to make sure that your DVI uh, is on the right trajectory, that it's actually going up and not going down as you make a number of changes and you start to uh, you know, work these levers, as I call them. So in terms of technology itself, um, there are four main, um, uh, four main things, you know, uh, four main capabilities, if I can call them that. So you have architecture, infrastructure, and platform testing and tooling. So I'll actually go into each and every one of them, uh, starting with architecture. Now, in architecture, there are probably two main uh, things. One is around um, software architecture itself and, you know, how uh, modular and loosely coupled your architecture is. And, uh, you know, there's also other questions related to how often do your developers write custom code to integrate with your line of business systems like SAP and, and Salesforce and all those kind of things. Now, one of the things is that uh, when we actually start to move over to things like microservices architecture and all that kind of stuff, it kind of like makes your architecture loosely coupled to start with. So, um, so that, that could actually help when, um, in helping improve this metric as a whole. The other big uh, one is around data architecture. So uh, data architecture is like, you know, it's all about, is it, you know, first thing is like, is it running in the cloud? Is your, uh, is the architecture, data architecture scalable and reusable, uh, the, the data pipelines themselves? Uh, does it kind of like start to integrate with, um, with different sources? Can you actually bring in so, uh, data from other sources and quickly integrate with it? Um, do you allow people to access the data at real time? So do you have like real time or near real time access to data in the form of uh, events and microservices and all that kind of stuff? And whether data is organized and documented based on specific domain. Now, one of the things that I've actually seen um, in the last uh, few years is that a lot and a lot of companies are investing a lot in, in, in the data architecture space. You know, you have things like enterprise data platform and data center of excellences and things like that being set up by a lot, a lot of teams. Um, you know, AGL, NAB, and, um, you know, organizations like Coles and so on. So you can actually see that there's a big emphasis on data architecture, it's just not software architecture. For a long time, people were focusing on how, you know, if we uh, kind of like moved away from monolithic ar architecture and kind of like start to build modular and loosely coupled architecture in the form of things like microservices that will actually uh, help the business in the long term. But I think uh, data architecture is becoming a really important part of this whole thing as well. The second thing is around infrastructure and platform. Um, you know, and, and I think, uh, you know, uh, the adoption of cloud, public cloud particularly, is, a, um, is, an, is an important uh, part of uh, improving your overall metric. Um, you know, it depends on, you know, how much of your workload is running on on-prem, how much is it like running on private, and, you know, how much of it is it running on public cloud, uh, what is the split between IaaS and PaaS and all those kind of things. Um, and one of the more important things is like, what's the organization policy on using public cloud? Um, so a lot of organizations, I mean, particularly if you're in things like government and so on, you know, that they kind of like, uh, in, you know, that they kind of like, or, or because the organizations already have investment in existing, you know, private cloud infrastructure, they don't let uh, developers move on to public cloud. So that may be a bit of, a, a, you know, not be a great thing in terms of, um, uh, DVI uh, score itself. Now, I, I say that mainly because a lot of, uh, although we talk about things like private cloud and so on and so forth, in terms of richness, in terms of features, um, private clouds aren't there yet. I mean, you know, you could, you know, provisioning uh, services on demand and also, you know, cl cloud providers like Azure and Amazon and Google, they kind of like start releasing lots and lots of um, platform as a service components as well. So that kind of like brings to my next point around adoption of PaaS within the organization. So, you know, private clouds will not be able to keep up, are not able to keep up with that. A lot of stuff, you know, most of the private clouds these days are just IaaS services and nothing more than that, right? The other uh, big thing is around infrastructure as a code. Now, is your organization, um, 
you know, can you quickly provision environments that mirror production easily? Now, as we all know, when you talk about infrastructure as code, you have your, um, you know, from you'd be able to reproduce or provision your whole environment just out of your uh, of your code itself. And of course, you know, this code is on version control and everything else. So, how good is your organization in uh, maturity in terms of doing things like infrastructure cloud? Infrastructure as cloud, uh, infrastructure as code, and deploying it to into production, and even non non uh, production environments easily. The next capability uh, in DBI is around uh, around testing. So, how much of you know, particularly how much of your testing is automated, and whether you use things like TDD. Um, you know, uh, you know, unit tests. You know, single. You know, this is basically to test a single unit, like a class or a method or a function. And um, obviously these are written by developers. Now, TDD usually takes this um, one step further, but I've got to say that TDD is not a prerequisite for doing unit testing. And a lot of organizations that have a lot of existing code find it difficult to, uh, to do TDD, but you know, unit testing is, is you know, at least they're able to get in and uh, that's a good thing. Um, integration testing is another one. Um, how well do you guys do integration testing within the organization? Particularly, you know, when you want to, uh, um, connect to um, external interfaces. Do you use some kind of a test double? Do you, know, do you use things like um, you know mocks, stubs, fakes, and everything else? Uh, all of that kind of like forms uh, part of the integration testing uh, story. How much of your tests are automated? Um, do you use even things like um, BDD and so on? Is, is, is a good measure. Uh, performance testing is is is, is also an, an important uh, part of this, this equation. Um, you know, at, uh, at AGL, uh, you know, we, we do have synthetic tests that actually go in and test performance of specific functions within the website. So if someone's actually, let's say, creating an account, you know, we kind of like measure end to end how long it actually takes to, um, to run it as part of your synthetic tests and so on. You can actually take it and we do it in production, right? And if, if, the, if the production actually drops, um, you know, um, we kind of like uh, have alerts and, and things like that. But um, you can actually also put it as part of your build pipeline. So, um, you know, all that is part of your overall maturity in terms of, of testing itself. And uh, then the, one of the other important things is around tooling. So we talk about tooling, um, you know, how, how good is your developer tool chain? And the developer tool chain is not just your Visual Studio or Visual Studio code or, or you know, the, the tools that developers actually use, but it's a lot more than that. Do you have good planning tools? You know, for example, at AGL, we use things like Jira. Um, you know, a lot of people use, uh, um, you know, and, and then what do you use for collaboration? Do you use things like Teams and Slack and everything else? Um, and of course, you know, are developers able to choose a multiple, multiple tools to do their, their job? It's not like an organization basically says, no, you only use Visual Studio and nothing more than that, right? So uh, how much of a freedom do, the, does the organization give uh, developers in choosing some of these things? Um, what about things like, uh, uh, you know, other DevOps tools and everything else? So all of this kind of like the, the importance of choosing good tools um, is, um, you know, it, it, it is, uh, it, it kind of like drives your uh, DBI. It's an important thing to remember. Low or no code tools, uh, uh, you know, what is the organization's capability to empower citizen developers to realize business functionality? You know, um, we, we talk about, uh, uh, you know, Power Automate and, and so on and so forth. Can, can developers actually use some of those um, things in the Power Platform to create, um, you know, applications even, right? Uh, that without writing uh, much code. And that's an important factor to consider. Uh, the last one is around uh, the use of AI assistance for things like production, product design, coding, testing, and security. At AGL, at least in security, we use something called Casada that uh, that does a lot of uh, that uses AI. Um, but in terms of uh, of testing itself, um, we we also use a, a tool called uh, Sauce Labs. Um, although we probably don't use the, some of the AI features in there, um, you know, a tool like Sauce Labs allows you to do a bunch of things. I mean, there's a lot of things that you can actually use AI to do in um, in, in automating some of the testing things. Um, you can even use it to, um, you know, for example, you can actually use it to determine 
failure of tests, right? Based on test results, or you can allow it to automatically create uh, tests based on you know test cases and everything else based on the code. From a coding perspective, um, you know there are there are tools like uh, Visual Studio IntelliCode. Uh, it's a plugin that basically what it does it looks at um, you know thousands of open source projects that are there on GitHub. Um, particularly the ones that have like a, you know over 100 stars and provides users uh, or developers coders with suggestions when they're when they're writing code. Uh, there are also so so there's a whole bunch of things uh, around using some of these AI based tools to help you with uh, developing uh, you know or coding itself. So how uh, is your organization using a lot of these things? Um, that will actually uh, drive your DBI score as well. So the next um, big uh, uh, category is around um, working practices. Um, when we talk about working practices, we talk about things like engineering practices, agile practices, security and compliance, and also around the use of open source and inner, uh, inner source within, your organ within the organization. Let's actually start to dig a little bit deeper into the engineering practices itself. So engineering practice is all about how uh, num it co consists of a number of things. And the first and foremost is like, how does your organization manage uh, technical debt? Do you kind of like, do you actively avoid it? Uh, do you have remediation work? You know, you kind of like, at every sprint, you start to put some of these things in, in your backlog and you start to address it. So how does your organization handle those things? Uh, does your organization have coding guidelines and standardization, and standardizations across the organizations? And how is this, um, you know, the code guidelines and things like that implemented? Do you have things like peer review of code? Um, and how long does it actually, uh, you know, how frequently is a peer review done? How long does it get to, to get it done as well? You know, does it take, uh, for example, you check in your code, you know, you've asked for a, uh, you know, put in a PR um, um, and, and then, you know, someone, you know, does it take like weeks for it to be a peer reviewed and merged? All those kind of things are important, um, uh, uh, Factors, um, CI/CD uh, practice is also uh, an important one. You know, how do you, uh, how do you, you know, how 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 good is your, um, uh, how does your code get deployed? Right? How is how good is your CI/CD pipeline? How do you deploy? Do you do things like continuous uh, deployment? Um, even things like version control is, is an important factor in this. Do you use uh, things like feature branching or do you use trunk-based development? Right. So if you read through the state of DevOps report, it basically re recommends that trunk-based development um, will help you uh, move to continuous development sooner. So do you do those things? What about things like uh, uh, releasing to, to production? Do you do things like uh, blue-green deployment, um, you know, A-B testing? Do you kind of like use uh, leverage on telemetry data? Um, do you uh, feature flag, like, you know, do you kind of like have a lot of latent code and you kind of like do dark launches, you know, feature flagging, do you do blue green, all of these kind of things contribute. Uh, these kind of like good, these kind of engineering practices kind of like help you um, in, in kind of like measuring the maturity of, uh, of your engineering practices itself. Security compliance, um, you know, DevSecOps, you know, which is basically the combination of DevOps and security is kind of like taking off in a big way now. And uh, if you followed a lot of the DevSecOps practices, then that would help uh, improve your DBI score. Uh, in terms of security best practices, like, you know, when do you do security testing? Is, is, it, is it done just before you release? Is it done throughout? Are there, uh, uh, you know, what other practices that you follow? Do you have security tools within the, you know, the, the build pipeline? Um, you know, how are your, what are your security policies? All those, do you have security policy stuff? You know, how all those kind of things form part of your security best practices. Um, I think one of the other questions that, that gets asked is like, how long does it take for you to resolve major security uh, breach? Does it take you hours? Does it take you days? All those kind of things are important. Also around compliance, how long does it take for you, um, you know, if someone basically asks you to do, if you need to get a regulatory compliance checking done, how long does it take? Does it take you um, days? hours, weeks, whatever it is. So all of those kind of things are important factors as well. So open source um, and inner source is, a, is another one of those cave, uh, uh, categories. So it'll be, so what are the policies around open source within your organization? Like do you, do, there are some organizations that actively discourage its use, right? 
So when we talk about OSs, there are two things. One is like, does your organization use some of these, um, you know, you know what, oh, if some of these open source, um, you know, libraries and code and everything else. And um, if it is like, how, how is the use control? I mean, basically, do we have someone saying, well, these are the ones that you can actually use? And, um, you know, do they actively look, or, you know, if developers can actually basically go and plug something in, um, and if, if that happens, like, you know, how do you, how do you check for things like vulnerabilities and so on and so forth? So, or, you know, do you have something in your build pipeline that checks whether that's the latest uh, version of um, the OSS um, library or code that you've actually used? So all those kind of uh, factors help in determining um, your DVI score. And again, it's, it's also about just not using OSS. It's also about contribution. Um, at AGL, for example, like I, I, published like an internal uh, white paper and talks about, uh, you know, what are the things that we need to do to support OSS within the organization and how to, uh, um, how to encourage people to, to contributing, uh, to contribute to, uh, to OSS as well. And there are a number of things that can actually be a, a problem, right? Even within things like um, the organization's, uh, you know, your employment contract is a very good example, right? Are you allowed to contribute to open source while you're working for another company? Um, all of those things are uh, are uh, are quite important to look at. So, does your organization basically um, support contribution and how well it supports it? These are important questions to ask. And uh, one thing that I'll actually say is that um, it has been found that organizations that actually <coughs> uh, support OSS contribution also um, you know, retain their employees and things like that. So there are other benefits of, of actually uh, helping people contribute to OSS. Now, this, uh, you know, the OSS culture also kind of like extends to inner source adoption. So when you talk about inner source, like, you know, can, uh, are there, uh, if, you know, how well can one team access and, um, you know, code and libraries from other teams? Uh, so basically can we reuse services and source code from other teams? Can we make changes to these, these, you know, the code that we actually access? Um, and uh, so all of these kind of things uh, play a big part in determining, um, you know, the, OI, the inner source option is an important uh, part of your overall DBI metric as well. Um, Agile team practices. Um, McKinsey basically uh, talks about, uh, you know, the, the paper that McKinsey actually uh, uh, published they talk a lot about agile team practicing you know, things like work in progress management and you know how do we follow agile services whether we have things like definition of done and so on uh, interestingly when um, the microsoft survey or the tool doesn't have any questions related to that uh, i think they kind of like uh, they gather some of these metrics with kind of like similar questions in organization enablement which i'll talk um, in a bit um, but they don't really ask these questions but these are an important another important thing in determining your overall uh, DBI score. So um, moving over to the organization enablement, um, there are five capabilities in here. You talk about things like team characteristics, um, organizational agility, product management, talent management, and, and culture. So let's start with the team characteristic. Team characteristics is all about, um, I mean, there's a bunch of things. First is like, um, it, it talks about autonomous scope, you know, that is our teams able to deliver goals fully autonomously. So if I give a, a piece of task to a team, are they dependent on other teams um, or can they actually do something on their own? Um, and that's, that's an important uh, factor. And uh, you know, how are, uh, uh, you know, how are these teams actually um, uh, structured? So like how often are these teams structured to be cross-functional part? So they have, uh, you, you know, uh, software engineers, product owners, designers, and everything else as part of the team itself. Um, there are a couple of other uh, things that McKinsey had, I mean, particularly around uh, whether the teams are co-located and uh, uh, whether there's a lot of context switching that um, teams need. I think, interestingly, in light of things like COVID and everything else, and we've learned to work uh, with a team that is actually fully distributed. And I actually feel that, you know, the, the measurement of whether the team or, you know, the, the question on whether the teams are co-located is kind of like irrelevant now. Uh, even like uh, companies like Microsoft and you know, a lot of people, right, Atlassian and so on, and they kind of like, and Google, they're all actively encouraging people to say, you know, if you want to continue working uh, 
from home, uh, you know, can, you know, you can continue to do so, uh, you know, at least for the next year and a bit, which is kind of like interesting. So, so I don't think uh, being co-located is going to have a big impact on these things. The next one is around uh, organizational agility. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, first thing is like on dependency management, how well can teams identify interdependencies through clearly defined process? So if I'm an API team and I need to talk to, uh, you know, some other team, uh, can I quickly, based on the task and everything, can I quickly uh, identify what those interdependencies are and um, all those kind of things? I mean, that's, that's an important thing to, uh, to know. How is the funding mechanism done? This is an interesting thing because uh, if you're working for a large uh, corporates and enterprise and things like that, you, you kind of like need to uh, work out and say, hey, well, this is what my budget is going to be for FY21. Or, you know, and you need to kind of like do it in uh, you know, January of 21 itself, right? And, um, or, you know, or then for the next year, you got to kind of, kind of like do it on January. And uh, so a lot of these things are locked in. And so uh, that's, that's kind of like the old way of, of doing things. So in terms of funding model, right? So do we use some kind of an agile funding model? So um, kind of like the funding, uh, the budgeting is done for a product asynchronously rather than the traditional uh, um, you know, yearly project-based ones, right? Uh, and is the funding itself based on clear business objectives rather than um, you know, allocating, uh, you know, uh, based on projects and things like that, right? So I think those are kind of like important things. And, the, the, and then the, again, portfolio management is important. So we do a lot of programs and projects and everything else in a large organization, but in the end, are we tying it to actual business outcomes? Because a lot of times you kind of like finish the project and you move on, but you don't really measure whether it's actually met its original goals and so on and so forth. So how well do organizations do that? Uh, and how do they manage it uh, from a financial point of view is, is kind of like good, really important things. Um, how good is the project management uh, capability? And uh, this, is, this is kind of an interesting uh, thing because, um, you know, um, do, the, do, the, do, the, do, the, do the product management team kind of like, like use like the uh, design thinking techniques and so on, uh, that you do things like journey maps and, um, uh, whether they do things like analyzing the market trends, competition, um, you know, all those kind of things are, are, are quite important to the overall product management. How mature is this capability is, is kind of like important in driving the overall um, developer velocity as well. Um, do we also capture, uh, you know, the, the product telemetry is an important thing, maturity of the product data collected. So it's not enough if you kind of like start to measure a whole bunch of things um, uh, from the users, are we taking some actions based on it and changing the product design and everything else based on some of the data that we've, we've collected? Um, do we have things like rapid prototyping tools? Um, those are kind of like another, those are kind of like important um, uh, measures as well. Talent management is again um, uh, comes up as part of the overall DBI um, uh, strategy, I suppose. Um, you know, what is our approach to recruiting um, developers, and how do we actually manage them? What are, how do we actually manage things like incentives uh, for these people? Um, you know, do we have good learning programs within the organization? Um, knowledge bases, you know, training programs and things like that to kind of like help build uh, developers. Um, um, team health is, a, is another one. Do we actually measure and monitor and act on team health? Um, we kind of like use, um, you know, Atlassian has a, as a, as a tool to measure team health. So we kind of like use that and, you know, at the end of every sprint to measure team health and so on. So that's, that's an, that's an important, um, factor. What is the employee value proposition? So if, um, uh, you know, if, if someone wants to work in the company, like what is it that we actually offer them? So uh, who would like to work here? You know, we've, we've actually gone and, you know, sometimes you go to conference and things like that and you see people talking and presenting on some wonderful stuff that they've actually been using in the organization. And immediately you think like, oh, that looks like, a, that sounds like a really cool place to work. And this is exactly what I want to work on, right? So do we have some kind of a value proposition for people who want to come and join us? Do we have clear um, 
you know, pathways for engineers. Uh, this is, this is an interesting thing. Um, when I used to work at, uh, Redify, Telstra Purple now, we used to kind of like clearly define what each and every role did. And, you know, at that point in time, I'm assuming that some of that still holds, uh, we publish a lot of the stuff on GitHub as well. So whether, you know, how do you actually move from, uh, from one role to another in terms of career progression and so on? We do the same thing at Asia. Like we put some effort into trying to define career paths for a lot of people. Um, so you find that there are people who are very technical, who want to stay technical, don't want to have like people management skills and things like that. So are there pathways for a lot of these people? So having this clearly defined pathway will kind of like help with the overall um, developer velocity uh, metric as a whole. Um, culture, right? Psychological safety. So, um, Psychological safety is probably, you know, this is the thing where um, our developers are allowed to fail and fail in a safe environment. So they're not basically uh, penalized for failures and things like that because they've actually tried something new, right? So failures are openly discussed, you know, you kind of like work in a high trust, uh, inclusive environment. And that's, that's important. This, this kind of like comes up uh, quite often. Uh, even in, uh, you know, Google has a project called, uh, they, they, they had like a, uh, there's something called Google Aristotle, right? And one of the things that it actually um, identified was that psychological safety was probably it was the number one fact, important thing for team members. So a lot of these things help in, in retaining people and everything else as well. So again, in terms of culture, like, you know, collaboration and knowledge, sir, uh, knowledge sharing, do teams have a strong sense of collective ownership of, of the product and customer outcome? Um, do they, um, you know, they actively share the knowledge around, uh, you know, how uh, good is the cross-functional collaboration within, within teams? Uh, is that encouraged and rewarded? All of these things are important. Uh, and of course, as is the continuous improvement culture, where you're constantly striving to improve the overall capability of the team itself. Uh, and last but not the least, you know, there are, there are two things, you know, like one is around the servant leadership. Uh, basically leaders uh, lead through empowerment instead of command and control. A lot of times if you are following things like um, Scrum and everything else, which kind of like encourages this kind of behavior, um, you know, you kind of like already have some of these things entrenched within your organization. And, you know, the culture of customer obsession. Um, if you look at Amazon's, um, you know, leadership principles, right? Customer obsession is probably number, you know, it's, it's one of those things. So do you kind of like start to apply things like design thinking, A-B testing, user research and everything else? Um, that kind of like, and when you do that and, and it's a part of the overall culture of the organization, not just, you know, like a product team or something like that. So these things are, are quite important. So I kind of like rushed through all of that stuff. So I want to kind of like uh, talk about what you can actually, uh, about some of the research observations. Now, McKinsey did a lot of research, right? So when they went in and, and before they wrote the paper, they conducted, uh, spoke to several organizations, um, 440 organizations to be accurate and spread across multiple industries in multiple countries. And they said, well, what are the levers that you can actually pull or push to get the maximum impact on, 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 on um, developer velocity or productivity, right? And it kind of like boiled down to these four things. Not that the others aren't important, but they actually found that these four things gave you the, the maximum bang for buck. Your tools, production management, um, or product management, product management, um, culture of the organization, and how you manage your talent. So, um, uh, so you know, the, if, if, I look, if I look at this, right, so there are uh, a, a few things that I want to point out. So what were the main ways to improve? There are five things that they specifically called out. So the number one thing was empowering developers with world-class tools. And I think I touched upon this tooling uh, earlier, right? So top companies give developers a degree of choice. So they kind of like give them about two to five options, and, um, but they restrict ad hoc tool usage. So effectively different tools to fit the different parts of the software lifecycle itself. Uh, that's one thing. The second one was around um, provision of low code and no code environments. Um, so that you could actually have, you know, what we call a citizen developers to, uh, to, to build applications and so on. 
like I mentioned earlier, the Microsoft Power Platform, right, is, is a good example of a, a low-code, uh, no-code environment. The second one is around the creating a culture that fosters psychological safety. Um, you know, this is this is probably this is even more important than, than things like uh, continuous integration, knowledge sharing, servant leadership mindset, and customer-centric philosophy, which are all correlated to uh, superior business performance. Um, if people, um, you know, think that they're in a safe place where they can actually fail without being judged, and um, you know, that's 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 I think enabling that is, is, a, is a really important thing. And, you know, as well as, you know, it's kind of like as, a, uh, as an extension of that is on recognizing employee achievement. So you want to kind of like reward while you don't punish them for, you know, things that have gone wrong. You also kind of like reward outstanding contributions and uh, publicly acknowledge, um, you know, what they've actually done. It's also important for retaining good talent, which kind of contributes to the overall, um, you know, you know, like having a better DBI score. Product uh, management function, um, you know, basically, uh, you know, can you build the right products, uh, is the products, uh, the right products built in the right way to deliver compelling customer um, experience. So that's, you know, that's, that's an important factor. But one key thing that I'll actually point out, and it was there in the slide, but I didn't actually call it out explicitly, was that they found that when uh, people from the product management team have uh, come from a technical background or they actually understand the technology um, you know, on which uh, the product is running, it kind of like, um, it, it, it kind of like helps immensely. And finally, the, the piece around talent management itself, right? I mean, one thing that um, gets talked around the industry is, is this concept of these rock star developers, right? Developers who can be 10 times, 10x times more productive than the average developer. It, this is, you know, 10x is debatable, right? And I'm not going to start talking about whether, you know, whether rockstar developers do give 10, 10x uh, better performance. But there's no debate around the fact that talented developers increase your uh, developer velocity score. And uh, so you can actually help uh, by having good incentives, you know, have like multifaceted recruiting programs, ongoing learning programs for these people. And, you know, we spoke about engineering paths. So if you have these well-defined engineering career paths, active measurement of team health and all those kind of things. All of these things will help in retailing, uh, in retaining um, good talent. So apart from these, these things, right, there were a couple of two other things that were also, uh, the, you know, that were found. One was around the adoption of, of, of open source within the, the organization. Like I mentioned earlier, um, just having the culture of contributing to open source and everything else kind of like attracted a lot of developers to the organization itself, number one. The second thing was around um, the adoption of public cloud. Now, the adoption of public cloud is seen as a catalyst for non-software companies where, you know, when they measured it, it seemed that it, you know, it had like a 4X impact on business performance itself. So not that it didn't help um, software companies when they moved to the, when they adopted public cloud, but especially it was true for um, non-software companies to do a lot of, um, you know, to, to, to adopt cloud. So kind of like want to finish off with, uh, with further reading. Um, I think the McKinsey paper is, is a good read. It's titled Developer Velocity, How Software Excellence Fuels Business Performance. Um, it's, it's a long read, but it's actually quite worth it, I feel. You can also have a look at the Microsoft tool um, that allows you to assess your company's um, developer velocity. So the velocity score is some, I think it's, it's from zero to five. And obviously the higher the score you get, the better you are. But I think more importantly, it allows you to track where your organization or your team is going um, overall. So the goal should be to, well, you know, it doesn't matter whether you land a score of three, you know, it at least helps you identify, look, you know, these are some of the areas that we can actually improve on, right? And then you start to pull those levers and then you can actually go and do the assessment again. And then over a period of time, you can actually see whether your, um, uh, you, you know, whether your DVI over a period of time is heading in the right direction. The other one I would actually recommend is um, is a state of uh, DevOps document. I mean, again, um, it talks a lot around things like continuous de deployment and you know how you can actually do it. But um, again, there are lots of things in that document that will help 
you um, improve your overall, um, I suppose, developer velocity and you know how you manage uh, uh, your teams and everything else. As well.